Welcome to the ranch everyone. On this installment of Herpetal Intros, we are going to meet one of the smallest species of tortoise in the world, the spider tortoise of Madagascar. While there may be two or three smaller species in either South Africa, in American collections, the spider tortoise is about as small as they get. If you think this is something that you might find interesting, stick around. There are three subspecies of this tortoise, all with very unique identifiers. The nominate species is designated as Pyxis arachnoides arachnoides. The southern species of spider tortoise is Pyxis arachnoides oblonga. And the northern spider tortoise is designated as Pyxis arachnoides brigui. Thanks to Andrew and Julene of the Arizona Tortoise Compound, we'll be looking at two of the three subspecies. I only keep a single male northern spider tortoise in my shelled herd. They're a very welcoming couple and were kind enough to let me come over and shoot some footage of their collection of spider tortoises. The name spider tortoise comes from the patterns of radiations emanating from each scoot and looked at as a whole over the entire carapace or top of the shell. As the tortoises age, the margins of the scoots develop a whitening adding to the overall web-like pattern. In nature, as they age, the patterns seem to reduce substantially leaving an overall yellow appearance. When viewed next to a radiated tortoise of similar size to an adult spider tortoise, the shell markings are quite different. When viewing hatchlings, one could definitely be forgiven for mistaking one for the other. Looking at this picture, can you tell which one is a spider tortoise and which one is a radiated tortoise? So, did you guess correctly? Like all species of Malagasy tortoises, the spider tortoises have a neutral scoot. The plastrons help us distinguish each subspecies. The northern subspecies seen here has a solid plastron with no markings. The nominate subspecies seen here has a flexible front lobe of its plastron. Not quite as flexible as a box turtle, but far more so than any other tortoise species. The southern subspecies is easily distinguished by the random black blotching on its underside. It has the most flexible plastron of the three subspecies and can withdraw its arms and head and completely close the front of its shell. Unlike box turtles, they cannot close the back of their shell. Similar to their close relatives in the Astrochellus and Adabrachellus genera, spider tortoises possess a fleshy valve that allows them to drink water through their nostrils. While these little guys certainly could get their mouths into small pockets of water that their larger cousins could only dream of, this adaptation seems like it would aid them in drinking droplets left over by coastal fogs. The skin on the head, neck, and limbs varies in color. There are blacks, hues of yellow, green, and white on the scales of their heads. Sometimes the skin can even be an, a light grayish color. The shield scales on the arms and legs are very often a ghostly white color, the color of glow-in-the-dark paint. The rest of the arm being much darker and mirroring the generally dark grayish black color of the neck skin. While they do have some physical traits that classically separate males from females, overall, males and females achieve the same adult size, averaging 11 centimeters or just over four and a quarter inches. Adult weight seems to fall somewhere between 160 and 200 grams or five to seven ounces. These averages seem to hold true throughout all three subspecies. As I mentioned, there is some sexual dimorphism. Like the majority of turtles and tortoises, Males have a concave plastron, females do not. Now, these sizes and weights are averages and variations amongst individuals in the wild and in captive collections will likely exceed or fall short. That's simply individual variability. As you can see on this map, barred from a book that I own, the tortoises and turtles of Madagascar, the spider tortoise is a coastal species. The nominate spider and southern spider share habitat with their much larger cousins, the radiated tortoise, though the radiated tortoise range spans much farther inland. In the north of their range, sandy and coasty soils support dry, deciduous spiny forest, while the southernmost subspecies would call rocky, hardened scrubland home. Their native habitat experiences a pronounced dry period during which this tortoise will estivate. From April until the rains return in November, this tortoise literally digs in and waits out the hot, dry season. Successful breeders of these tortoises, this tortoise literally digs in and waits out the dry season. 
Successful breeders of these tortoises believe this seasonal sleep cycle is absolutely required for reproduction to occur. Keepers will induce a three to four month brumation period by dropping both day and nighttime temperatures by about 10 to 15 degrees Fahrenheit. Tortoises in Madagascar have had a lot of press in the last few years, whether it's record-breaking confiscations of smuggled radiated tortoises or news on the ever-dwindling population of the plowshare tortoises. Malagasy tortoises are in dire straits. Spider tortoises are no exception. One study estimates a spider tortoise will be functionally extinct within the century solely from habitat loss. Estimates put the percentage of this habitat loss since the mid-1980s at over 70%. This study did not take into account exploitation by humans for food and the illegal pet trade. Having achieved CITES-1 status in 2004, the export has been slowed somewhat, but of course there is a black market and even the most protected tortoises are exploited. Locally, these tortoises are now being viewed as a source of food in the areas that radiated tortoises have been extirpated. Once viewed as a taboo by the indigenous, once viewed as a taboo by the indigenous Malagasy peoples, eating tortoises by locals and migrants has become the norm. There are breeding individuals housed in the existing tortoise sanctuaries in Madagascar, but it is unknown if subspecies are being separate, separated. It is unknown if subspecies are being separated, preserving the wild bloodlines. Wild integrated, ha wild integrated have been documented, but this is the exception rather than commonplace. Outside of Madagascar, the spider tortoise is kept by both zoological parks, numerous private keepers, and conservation entities. I've had success keeping spud using basically the same format I use for baby tortoises. Temperatures are maintained in the 80s, humidity is similar. My spider enclosure does experience nighttime temperature drop into the mid-70s. As you can see, his enclosure is well planted with both pothos and spider plants. Clovers and apuncha cactus do well in the terrarium right up to the point that they are consumed. Water is always available in his enclosure. Additionally, he'll get a weekly soak or two. And food is offered daily. When it comes to food, mostly veggies, some bugs. Spud here in particular prefers leafy greens to strawberries, mushrooms, squash, or zucchini. These latter four food items can definitely be chopped up and fed to tortoises that will eat them, as can cactus pads from the Apuncha genus. Spud simply just doesn't like them. Though prickly pear cactus have been introduced into Madagascar, and the tortoises do eat the seasonal fruits produced by the cactus, most of its environment is devoid of any sweet fruits. They have been observed in the wild eating dung and bugs around the dung. Spud here has taken an earthworm or two and has also expressed interest in and consumed soldier fly larvae and waxworms. I offer animal protein so rarely though that I couldn't put the frequency in terms of months or even quarters of the year, so the term occasionally is the best I can give you. Artificial diets like Missouri, seen here, and Zoomed are also usually are readily accepted by spud and pretty much most other tortoises. When it comes to his behavior, spud was 12 to 13 years old when I acquired him. His previous caretakers did an excellent job of habituating him to human contact. He is very comfortable with human interactions. He's a very inquisitive and will often quickly make his way to the open doors when I'm feeding, watering, or performing enclosure maintenance. Similar to other well-acclimated tortoises, a few nose bumps and his curiosity is satisfied, and then food is expected. Though his previous caretakers did not utilize Spud in a breeding program, they still encourage a seasonal period of rest. Although I initially maintained rather constant day and nighttime temperatures, Spud was not fooled. He was likely triggered by the shifts in the spectrum of light produced by the sun as the seasons change and the sun's relative position in the sky waxes and wanes. During this time, he burrowed down into his substrate with barely the top of his shell exposed. Spud did not come out on his own from about late March until almost October. His weight going in was 170 grams, and by the time he was up and active, he only dropped 3 grams. This last year, he has not seemed to slow down nor presented any signals that he intends on taking a long nap. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you would like to learn more about this species, let me recommend an article from Reptiles Magazine from 2015 by Dr. Will Ahrens. 
Of course, everybody knows I love books. These three books are also useful sources of information on the spider tortoise. If you have access to an online academic library to know even more about spider tortoises, here are some articles from peer-reviewed journals available online. Once again, I'd like to thank the owner-operators of the Arizona Tourist Compound for their generosity and willingness to help me add substance to this video. If you haven't already, please subscribe to my channel, and if you found value in this episode, share it with your animal-loving friends. Thanks for watching.